Welcome to part two of a three-part series where I talk about the terminology as it relates to resin 3D printing. If you haven't seen part one yet, that's where I discuss all the components about the printer and what they're called, the physical components. I checked that one out first because there's some context that you might need for this video. And while you're there, make sure that you like and subscribe to the Light G Slicer YouTube channel. That way you're ready for when part three hits, which is gonna be the terminology on the slicer itself. And with that, let's get going. So to get started, let's talk about the different types of failures when it comes to resin 3D printing. To show you some visuals, I'm gonna head over to my guide, J3D's Tech Guide on Resin 3D Printing. There's actually two different versions of my guide live right now. One of them can be found on the Lychee Slicers website. The other one can be found on the All3DP website. So depending on which version you like the best, go check them both out. If you're on the Lychee Slicer documentation, you're just gonna scroll down, click on my guide, and right here you're gonna see troubleshooting print failures. And the first one, of course, is labeled as layer lines. So let's click on that to jump to that section. And so here we see the example of layer lines. Now, layer lines are not to be confused with stepping. The way you can tell the difference is stepping is generally where the, the thickness is the same and the pattern is the same. Almost like this pattern behind me, if it was set to 90 degrees, that would be stepping. And more on that in this particular video, where layer lines are gonna be inconsistent thicknesses and inconsistent spacing. Generally, layer lines are created by a printer that's not really running properly, so it's not very stable, but mostly it's printed by a part that's not supported properly, so it can kind of move during the print, or if it has suction cups in it. The next type of support failure is just the supports as we see here. Now, this is important to know because what I get all the time is someone say, my print finished and nothing printed. And when they show me a picture, what I see is a bunch of supports without models in it that's different. If nothing printed, well, that looks different than just the supports. So in this one, when the port, when the supports printed just fine, but the models aren't attached to them, again, that's what we call just the supports. Very different troubleshooting uh, steps than what we would take is if there's nothing on the build plate, which leads us to the next one, nothing on the build plate. And that's where basically everything didn't stick to the build plate. Now, what I see a lot of people say on this one is they'll say it's stuck to the FEP or stuck to the release film. That is not the terminology we wanna be using for this because that puts the blame on the release film when the blame is actually the build plate, the build plate's to blame here, or the bottom layers. And that's a very, again, that's a very different troubleshooting uh, system than what we talked about earlier, just the supports, which leads us into the next type, which is half of the build plate stuck. This is where you've got models on half of it, but not models on the other half. Again, this is a very different troubleshooting step than we would take for the other previous two. This one looks like this, where essentially you're missing prints. Now, sometimes the missing prints are in the center and sometimes they're random. That's also really important to know uh, if you're seeking help, whether or not they're like on one side, top, left, bottom, right, you know, whatever, just in the center they're missing or if they're missing randomly, as each one of those has very different and very unique troubleshooting steps. But anyway, that's half the build plate, uh, nothing on the build plate or just the supports. Those are three different terminologies that we see all the time and knowing to use the proper one when discussing the right type of failure is gonna help us help you a lot faster. But I think first we need to talk about what blooming is in general since it's a term I'm throwing around a lot. So blooming, I just kind of show this picture right here. This is like a, of a total eclipse. And so what you can see here is that the sun is kind of peeking through where the moon is. And that light that kind of escapes where it shouldn't be is what we call blooming. So if you can imagine in resin 3D printing, you've got this big uh, a light array with a lot of power. It's gonna shine up through resin that is not completely going to block the light. Some of it's going to kind of leak out the sides like this is, and that is what we call blooming. Now blooming takes place on X, Y, and Z axis. So what we're gonna start on first is what we call Z blooming or blooming on the Z axis, sometimes also known as cross curing. So what Z blooming is, is basically over penetration of the resin on the Z axis. And we can see what that looks like right here. These little squares, you can see they're not supposed to be filled in like that. They're supposed to all be open. So you can see right here, this was printed on 385 nanometer. Now 385 nanometer doesn't penetrate as deep. So on this one, we've got two holes open and a little bit of the third one. And if I have, have head over here to the 405 nanometer, they're all pretty much filled in. As you can see, the 385 is a little bit better at not cross curing or Z blooming. As of right now, the only printers that really come with a 385 are the GK3 Pro and the Athena 2 is going to come out with one that does have a 385 nanometer light engine 
in the future. The next type of support failure I call flaking, and this is where there's basically just not enough supports in an overhang. If you don't know, when resin cures, it takes three or four passes for it to become as hard as you know during post-processing. More on that later. And so that first layer as it cures it is like wet tissue paper. It's just gonna rip and kind of fold around without any supports to hold it together. So just adding more supports is gonna solve this type of failure, flaking. The next part here is gonna be all about the rafts. If you know what the raft is, it's this bottom part that kind of the basically makes contact with the build plate. That would be the raft. Now there's three different types of rafts that can cause failures. One of them would be a thin raft where it measures much thinner than it's supposed to be. A thick raft would be like this chunky thing here where it's much thicker than it's supposed to be. And then a split raft. A split raft is where basically the raft is split into two. That's a unique type of failure that we want to watch out for. Generally, a thick raft and a split raft have the same cause, not enough light off delay, Z offset isn't properly set. More on Z, Z offset later on in this video. But that's the prop, proper terminology for that one, split raft. The next one is the supports stopped printing. Now that's an interesting one, support stops printing. It's basically caused by the same issue as polished raft. It's just happening higher up in the build process where instead of happening right at the raft, it's happening some random place within the build plate. Generally also caused by layer crushing, um, not enough light off delay can solve that issue. So those two are related, uh, polished rafts and the supports stop printing. Those are the two different terminologies you wanna keep an eye on, on how to describe your issue if you're seeking for help. Earlier in this video, I talked about layer compression or missing layers. Let's show you real quick what I mean by that. If we look at this picture of boxes of calibration, I've got two pictures side by side. One of them, the raft here is really thick and it's got like this kind of weird texture to it. The other one over here, the raft is the crack thickness. And we also notice there's this extra row of holes that's missing on the one on the left. Well, this is a good example of layer compression. What's happening here is when the printer is going down and it's putting, you know, that build plate is going down, uh, retracting into the vat, there's too much pressure, too much PSI. And that layer height you thought you printed wasn't achieved. So let's say you're trying to print at 50 UM or 0.05 millimeters. That's a lot of pressure. And so if it can't achieve that and the UV light turns on and starts curing, well, you're gonna have a layer that's extra thick. The build plate's going to uh, go up, and it's gonna retract back down, but it doesn't know, the printer doesn't know it's got an extra thick layer it just printed. So it's gonna push down into the release film causing layer compression. And that's what we see right here on the bottom. That's flakiness is layer compression. As we move up further into the normal layers where there was less layer compression and the printer was able to kind of like catch up, what we have now is missing layers. And that missing layers, we know that one because there's supposed to be a row of circles here that are just gone. Now the missing layers were, in this case, were caused by layer compression. So it's kind of, it's somewhat the same thing, but it just kind of depends on where exactly in that process of failure you're looking. Anyway, this is generally solved through proper calibration, basically using light off delay as showed in this picture right here. These pictures are from another video that I made doing proper calibration using boxes of calibration. Go check that video out on the Lightsheet Slicer YouTube channel so you know how to do proper calibration to avoid problems like these, basically layer compression or missing layers. And earlier in this, I showed you something that looked like layer lines and how layer lines isn't stepping. Well, if you don't know what stepping is, that's the next section, stepping and voxels. So let's show you the difference and help you understand how they work, how they relate and what they mean and what they don't mean and a bunch of other mumbo jumbo. All right, so here, I have, uh, this is something I did on the Mars 5 Ultra, a very accurate printer, one I actually enjoy using quite a bit. And here I've got this, this little ball, it's actually very, very tiny. You probably can't see it, but it's the little tiny ball in the, in the bottom of this print right here. This is my uh, ultimate anti-aliasing test piece right there. Uh, you can find that on the Lychee Library or links uh, in any of my guides. So, all right, this is this zoomed up, zoomed in pretty far and um, image stacked. And these little circles right here, that's what we call voxels. Those are voxelizations. Those are stepping, stepping, created by the pixels on your LCD. But as we move to the very top here, you'll see that there's like these lines that appear. That's what we call stepping. And here's another example where I've removed the voxels using anti-aliasing, where the voxels have mostly been removed. It's There's still a little bit down here where you know, anti-aliasing can't be perfect, but it does a pretty good job. However, you can see here, the stepping is completely unaffected by anti-aliasing. That's because they're, they're really created by something completely different and anti-aliasing just can't affect stepping. And so the stepping you're gonna see mostly on um, like the tops of prints or on anything printed at an angle. And let's kinda, let's look at this from a different perspective and see if it helps if that was a little confusing. So here again, we have a picture of, this is just voxelization, no stepping here. And that's because this is the part of the print right here 
that's printed on the side. So this is sticking up directly 90 degrees from the build plate. And all we're capturing here is how accurate the pixels are. So as you can see here, the, the difference between the top and the bottom is just the, the angle in which it prints. And so like a, a more uh, an angle that has more depth versus an angle that's more shallow. Uh, with more depth, of course, you hit more pixels so you can get better stepping on pixels or voxelization. And this is with anti-aliasing turned on. You can see anti-aliasing actually does a really good job on this printer. Um, and if you want to see my anti-aliasing settings, I've got them listed right here. Um, this is the settings that I'm using in Lychee Slicer to get these results. And this is just the same thing, but on the Y axis instead of the X axis. Uh, you can see the stepping is, or the voxelization is pretty much removed. However, if we want to go look at stepping that's completely isolated, like I just showed you the voxelization isolated, this is an example of what stepping looks like isolated. And this is just different angles, um, you know, 90 or zero degrees or 90 degrees being straight up. And then as we kind of move over like this one, that's the angle you're getting. And you can see stepping always has like a pattern to it. And it's a repeating pattern. And sometimes that repeating pattern has more than one repeating pattern. For example, like right on this one, you've got these steps that are really um, shallow. Then every once in a while, you've got a bigger step. And that's common for stepping to look like that one. Sometimes it's a single line and sometimes it's not. But if we were to combine stepping and voxelization, again, uh, in a different way, you can get some really cool results. And you can kind of see here, we've got this like crosshatch pattern. But again, I hope that helps explain the difference between stepping and voxelization, how anti-aliasing can cure one and not the other. And why it can't is out of scope for this video. Maybe in the future, I can create a video on just anti-aliasing and how it works and why it does certain things and not. But let me know in the comments down below if that's something you would be interested in a uh, video on that. So here I want to talk about the difference between peeling forces and suction cups and how they're not the same, but they kind of are. So I guess here's some things to kind of demonstrate that one and I'll, I'll do my best. So everyone kind of knows what a suction cup is. So let's say I sprayed some water on my desk here. I take my little cup and I put it upside down, try to get a seal. That's a suction cup. So when you're 3D printing, a suction cup could be basically you've got a, a void or a hole or hollowing part in the model and it makes a suction cup. So when you try to peel it off the release film, is a suction cup and greatly increases the peeling force. However, that's not the only way suction cup actually applies. Here, I've got a build plate and let's say I'm doing the bottom layers and let's put it back on that uh, wet spot there. Shake the screen. And uh, that was also really hard to pull off because that was also a bit of a suction cup. So how do we use it? And well, what's peeling force? Well, let's show you what, the way peeling force is a little different from either of these. So let's just take my mouse right here. And let's say I'm printing my mouse that's you know on the bottom of my build plate here. And it's going down into the release film and back up. Well, the thing is this mouse as it's being printed, there's no suction cups in it and the build plate isn't so close to the release film that it's going to create a suction cup. At that point, we're only talking about peeling forces where basically that resin has been cured to the release film um, because you know when it was cured, it was up against it. And now we have to rip it off the release film. That's peeling force. And of course, the larger the cross section, so the bigger the object we're printing, the more peeling forces we're going to deal with. And if it gets so big, then we could add in peeling force and suction force without adding in suction cups. So anyway, I hope that's not confusing and it all makes sense. And now you know the difference between peeling force and suction cup and all that fun stuff. So I'm just going to clean up my desk and move on to the next uh, part of the video. The next terminology is making sure that your printer is level. But when we say that, we don't mean this. What we mean is making sure that the build plate is parallel to the LCD. This is generally done by loosening up the four bolts on the build plate, sending it to the home position, making sure you've got even pressure applied while you tighten up those four bolts. That way your build plate and the LCD will be level with each other or parallel with each other. But anyway, that's what we mean when we say make sure your printer is level. With that said, we want to make sure if you've got a printer like the Saturn IV Ultra here with the tilting vat, that you do actually take the time to level it. That way the resin won't splash out everywhere when it's printing. The reason for that being this vat of course tilts down and if the resin's in there pretty uneven, the printer won't know that and it might spill resin all over your printer destroying it. But this also gets into what is Z offset. And to help describe what Z offset is, um, we're gonna just look at this printer right here. This is the Frozen Mini 8KS, actually one of my top five favorite printers. Actually, I'm thinking of doing a video of my top five favorite printers and explaining why they're my top five. If that's a video you'd like to see, let me know in the comments down below. While you're there, hit like and subscribe.
So anyway, the way it works is you can see right here, this build arm is attached to this little piece of metal. And this metal will go down, it'll hit this Z offset switch, at which point the printer will know that the build arm is where it wants it to be. However, it has no idea where the build plate is, as this build plate can be leveled differently or independently of the build arm. So what Z offset does, it allows us to basically set this thing so it's at the correct height when layer one starts. Basically, we don't want, if we're printing at 50 UM, we don't want layer one, this thing to be so close, we're actually at 30. We also don't want to be so far away, we're at like 1.5 or one. So anyway, that's what, Z offset, that's what Z offset allows you to do, is set the printer so that layer one is where layer one should be. The next part of the video we're going to talk about is post-processing. There we go. The next part of this video I'm going to talk about is post-processing. What does that mean? Well, post-processing is after your print is finished, you have to post-process it. This entails removing it from the build plate using a scraper like that, removing the supports, and then cleaning it in generally a wash and cure station. Here's a dirty wash and cure station I've had. It's actually one of the first machines I ever bought. It's about three years old, so it's a little bit dirty. I actually threw away the wash station so you can't see it. But you clean it in generally IPA or something like that, which brings us to the next terminology, cleaning solution. What is IPA? Well, IPA or isopropyl, isopropyl, isopropyl alcohol. There's two other types of alcohols that are commonly used. Depending on where you live, they can actually be cheaper or more expensive than IPA. That's going to be ethanol or denatured alcohol. Denatured alcohol is the type of alcohol you could drink, but it's been denatured, meaning they've added crap to it that will kill you if you try to drink it. IPA is a synthetic type of alcohol. They're chemically different. And then there's ethanol, which is also chemically different. The pros and cons of each one is like IPA evaporates the fastest, leaves no residue behind. The denatured alcohol and ethanol evaporate slower, but they leave, a, they leave behind a residue. However, they are overall less toxic than IPA. Again, it's which one you use is just up to where you live and which one is cheaper and which one you want to use. There are two other types of cleaning solutions, basically water, if you're using water washable resin, and there's like the proprietary cleaning, cleaning solutions that are for resin 3D printing. Uh, when you use water, treat it like contaminated water, treat it like resin, uh, because it's had resin in it, so you have to you know, dispose of it properly, not down your drains. Same thing with the cleaning solution, just treat it properly. But anyway, all those clumped together, that's what we call cleaning solutions, which is what you're gonna use as part of your post-processing. All right, and I think that's it for this one. Make sure you share this with anyone who you think needs it. Also stay tuned for part three, where I cover all of the terminology used in Lychee Slicer. Make sure to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel because it helps me to continue making content like this for you. And if you haven't done it yet, join us on the Lychee Slicer Discord for any assistance you have with resin or even filament 3D printing. And as always, thank you for watching and have a good day.